So we're going to look at uh, the cadet verses that uh, are their theme this year. If you want to turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to focus on the first two verses. That's uh, the verses that the cadets are looking on. Um, I'm going to read uh, the first three. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. There's kind of some sports imagery here in uh, in this, this running a race marked out for us. And so, as, um, when I was sitting down to look at Bible reading tracks this week, I found that there's quite a few times when the Bible uses sports imagery to make a theological point of one kind or another. So if, if life is a game, if we're going to go off of that, those sorts of metaphors, if life is a game, then God is our goal. He is our goal. In verse 1 there, it says that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses there. Surrounded by witnesses, that kind of suggests, just the way that that is kind of painted there, that kind of suggests a, a stadium almost. So there's, uh, there's Ford Field there. I think many of you, how many of you have been to Ford Field? Okay, quite a few. All right. A stadium. We're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. A cloud of witnesses. Cloud is, is kind of a code back then for a, a large group of people. So we have Ford Field here. I have one more picture here. Uh, that's, the, that's the big house, Michigan Stadium in Ann Arbor. And I tried to get a picture from, more from the field looking up there. It was surrounded by tons of people. I don't know if you've ever... Who's been to Michigan Stadium? Just a few. Okay. That place is huge. There's a ton of people there. It's very loud. It's very exciting to be there. Hebrews draws this picture of being in a stadium here. And the Greeks, they were familiar with... Stadiums, Romans were too. We know of the Colosseum and, and that sort of a thing. Being surrounded by this crowd of people cheering on a game of one kind or another. They had all kinds of games back then. They had chariot races. They had boxing. They had bullfighting. They had gladiators. They, uh, and I have a couple pictures. Oops. Yep, Hebrews draws a picture of being a stadium. I have a couple pictures here. This is, this is the ancient games. Uh, depictions of them anyways. So they had, they had running, they had wrestling, and they had discus, and they had boxing and other things like that. Not unlike today. People played games back then too. So we have these games that we play. They had games that they played. But this, in this passage here, if you have your Bibles open, if you kind of glance at chapter 11 here, some of you might be familiar with this chapter. Sometimes it's called the Hall of Faith chapter. If you kind of just glance through it, there's all of these people that it talks about. So it talks about Abel, it talks about Enoch, Noah, Abraham, a lot on Abraham actually, uh, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and a bunch on Moses. It talks about Jericho and Rahab, and then he goes on, David, Jephthah, Samuel, the prophets, and so forth. <clears throat> Going all kind of through the Old Testament, look at all of these heroes of faith who have gone before us. So that was chapter 11. And now at the beginning of chapter 12, 
it says we are now surrounded by this cloud of witness, witnesses. So just before our passage, Hebrews gives this long list of heroes of faith. We have this long list of heroes of faith. And these heroes of faith now, it kind of depicts them in this stadium. These heroes of faith who have gone before us are now cheering us on. At least in a manner of speaking. This cloud of witnesses that is in chapter 11 are now in this stadium around us cheering us on. So just like we would cheer on people in in a football stadium or in a baseball diamond or whatever, the heroes of faith who have gone before us are now cheering us on. So we have our sports heroes, right? In every sport, there, there are certain people who kind of just stand out and they, kind of def- they play so well that they kind of define the whole sport. So some of you remember Barry Sanders, for example. He was a running back for the Detroit Lions. When that guy got the ball, he could just he could accelerate and dodge and move like nobody else could. He, he, was, he was amazing to watch. And there's others too. Michael Jordan, when he could dunk... That was just incredible to watch. Mickey Mantle, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Phelps more recently. There are people who kind of define the sport. They're they're kind of like heroes in these games that they play. Imagine imagine you were going to be playing a game of sorts, whether you're young or old. Imagine you were going to be playing and imagine that one of them came to watch you play. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Barry Sanders is coming to my game to watch me. Wow, that's really cool. Imagine history's greatest faith heroes watching your race of faith. That's pretty cool. Think about all these people that we read about in the Old Testament, all of the faith that they showed in their lifetimes in spite of all kinds of opposition and challenges, and they are now watching us. And they're cheering us on in this, in this stadium in heaven, maybe. They cheer for amazing feats of faith. We, we, don't, we don't cheer like, like for the things that they cheer for, necessarily. So in our stadiums, we, we cheer when uh, somebody carries a pig skin, pig skin across this white line here, right? That's when we cheer. They cheer when we persevere under trial. When we're facing all this opposition and we still hold on to our faith, they cheer for that. We cheer when a ball gets shot through a hoop in basketball. They cheer when we obey God under pressure. When it's really difficult when we're faced with this overwhelming temptation and we don't cave, we keep going, they cheer for that. We cheer when a rubber puck gets shot into a net. They cheer when we keep trusting God when even our world is crashing down around us and we still hold on to God's goodness and God's justice. They cheer for that. That's incredible. They cheer when we obey our parents, even when we think they're unreasonable. They cheer when anger becomes reconciliation. They cheer when we don't hit back or insult back. They cheer when we are mocked and shamed for following Christ, and we keep doing that anyways. That's when they cheer. They cheer for that. This is, this is not... Our lives are not an empty exercise that we are just supposed to enjoy for a time while we're alive. Sometimes, sometimes there's a lot of people who kind of live that way, you know. We only live once and just, just enjoy it, right? It's not that way. Your life is a contest of faith to win a heavenly crown. This is not an empty exercise. 
there's a heavenly crown in store for us. And that's our prize. James 1.12 Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. You, you are blessed when you persevere under trial. So, so we have this heavenly audience here, right? But here's the thing. If you're, if you're just enamored by applause, you're not going to be paying attention to the game, are you? If you, were, if you were a professional baseball player and all you could do is just stand around and look at all these cheering fans. Oh boy, everybody's cheering for me. That's so cool. You're not going to be paying attention to who's at bat or whether the ball's even coming your way. If you're looking for your fans, your cheering section there, you're not going to be paying attention to what you need to be paying attention to. So don't stare at the crowd. Play the game. In your life, don't just stop and stare at the crowd in heaven. That's not where our focus needs to be. It's there and it's exciting, it's cool. But that's not, that's not where our attention needs to be. We need to keep our eyes in front of us. Because we're playing, we're playing a game and not just an empty exercise. We're playing a game of faith with some big consequences and real rewards. This heavenly audience is barely mentioned in the Bible. This might be one of the, this is actually just one of the few times when it's actually mentioned. Probably because our attention is not supposed to be on this audience. It, it's there and we're kind of told about it, but, but that's, not, that's not the most important thing for us. We have a game to play. We need to get our heads in the game. We have some pretty fierce opponents in this game. Some really tough things to overcome. Your opponents are not linebackers or pitchers or goalies. We have some bigger things to worry about. Ephesians 6.12 says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, we're up against stuff we can't even see. Those are our enemies. Those are our opponents. Let's look at the screen here together and let's answer the question together. What does the sixth request of the Lord's Prayer mean? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one means... By ourselves, we are too weak to hold our own, even for a moment. And our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong with the strength of your Holy Spirit, so that we may not go down to defeat in this spiritual struggle but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. Do you notice where it kind of mentions our enemies here, our opponents? The devil and the world and our own flesh. This is what we're up against. In verse 1, what we just read, it says, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. So your opponents are the devil, the world, and your own flesh. Things that you can't exactly see or notice coming. This isn't like a regular game when you can see the ball, you can see your opponents, and the way forward is kind of clear all the time, or most of the time rather. So our challenge is to know what God says. Know what this says here. Be in the Word. Because our first opponent, the devil, he has this very clever trick. And that is as old as time itself. And his trick is, did God really say? Really? 
I mean, it kind of says that, but we could kind of find some ways around it. We could interpret this some different ways, couldn't we? Know what this says. Because the devil's trick is very slick and very sly, and it can hook a lot of people. Link arms with good people in your life. People who are godly. People who have their eyes on that prize. And who play the game really well. Because there's a lot of people out there who will take you down wrong paths. We tend to become like the people we hang out with. When you're making friends, when you're deciding how you want to spend your time, choose your, choose your friends pretty carefully. And our own flesh is our, is our opponent. Master your impulses. Master them. They are not the boss of you. You are the boss of them. You can decide how you want to respond to them. We don't think that way usually, but that is the truth. So be the boss of your anger. Just because something comes into your mind to say doesn't mean you have to say it. Be the boss of your sex drive. Our bodies are, are holy things. Not just things that we use for, for enjoyment. Be the boss of your eating and your drinking. Be the boss of buying. Be the boss of your words. You are in control. We have impulses and, and desires and thoughts, but that doesn't mean we have to act on them. You be the boss. Faith is a team sport also. In this struggle, we can't really stand alone. We have opponents that are much bigger and stronger than we are, and we have people around us who can play different positions in this game. So we might be a great wide receiver, but we need a quarterback to throw the ball to us in order for us to, to do what we need to do. You need a team. If you watch football, imagine that you were just a quarterback and there was no blockers at all. That'd be tough. How would you, how would you win that game if you had no offensive line? Let's say, let's say you're, you're playing baseball and, and you were a pitcher and you had no fielders. That'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? Because even the best pitchers on their best days, they still have, they still have batters that make contact. You need a body of believers. We all do. Make sure you're linking arms with people who can have your back and support you and block for you. We have different skills than just the ones that we see in, in the stadiums and the arenas. Your skill is not running or shooting or catching or throwing. That's not, that's not what our skills are in this game. Your skill is a narrow focus on Jesus Christ, like it says in verse 2. You've got to zero in on Him and concentrate on Him. Just Him. In sports, you may have heard this expression, keep your eye on the ball. Or at least I have many times. Keep your eye on the ball. That's, that's, that's in sports. In, in, in life, keep your eye on Jesus Christ. He's the one that you've got to concentrate on. So keep your eye on your Savior. He's our Savior. Keep your eye on Him. Our salvation is not in ourselves. It's not on the inside. It's on our Savior. Concentrate on Him. In Taekwondo, when we're sparring, we, we put our gloves on and we have pads on our feet. Sometimes we have chest pads and stuff. When, when we're sparring one another, the goal is to look each other in the eye. If you can see where your opponent is looking, you can know what they're doing before they even do it. It's difficult because as soon as they move and they're going to throw a punch, 
your eye's going to want to go to that punch. And you might get that punch and you might block it out of the way, but if they're a smart fighter, they're not just going to stop at that punch. They got two or three other punches coming after that. And if you're just concentrating on that one, oh, all right, I got it. Bam, bam, bam. It's happened to me many times. <laughs> okay? Look each other, looking each other in the eye. That's important. You have to have that focus in our lives. We need to have that focus on Jesus Christ. Who He is. What He's done for us. And to figure out how to apply His life to our lives. There's kind of a trick to that. I'll kind of go over that a little bit here. So for example, keeping your eye on your Savior. That means remember his temptation when you are tempted. When you're facing those temptations, urges, inklings, impulses, whatever, concentrate on his temptations. Remember him. In Hebrews chapter 2 it says, Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. When you're tempted, he's your help. If you try to just muster your own willpower, you'll lose. You'll be exhausted. So when you have cravings for junk food or porn or alcohol, when those cravings rear their ugly heads like that, remember his craving for bread when he was starving. Going for 40 days without food. You're, you're, in, you're in starvation mode at that point. Remember that. He himself suffered when he was tempted. He's able to help us when we are tempted. When, when you have this sense of lust, remember, remember his celibacy. He was celibate his whole life. When you have anger, remember the unanswered insults that he, he endured. Remember him at those last moments there and how many terrible things people said about him that were completely false and he said nothing in return. When you have envy and you're, you're wanting things that you can't have, and that happens to all of us, let's admit it. Remember how he laid aside unimaginable glory to become a, a baby in a manger, which we celebrated last month. Remember his temptations when you are tempted. Remember his sufferings when you suffer. We all suffer, some a little more than others, all of us in a little bit different ways, for sure. But remember what he went through when you were going through a rough time. In Philippians 3, it says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I want that. Is, is Paul kind of a crazy guy here? Or is he on to something? I think he's on to something. When, when you're suffering, and, and you will suffer, it's, it's part of the life that we're in, right? When you suffer, remember his sufferings. Because no matter how bad it gets for any of us, nothing can compare to what he suffered. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he said that, it was absolutely true because he faced the full pangs of hell. Nobody else has ever gone through that on earth as much as we might think we are. Remember his sufferings. Remember his love when it's hard to love. We're, we're all in relationships, right? Right? And sometimes it's hard to love these people that are around us because we're all human, we're all fallible, so even the best of us are going to have our moments and we're, it's not always going to be easy to love each other. It's not. But remember His love. Think about how many times we have failed Him. How many times. And He still forgives us. We still have a relationship of grace there. He still accepts us. 
That's amazing, isn't it? He's given us lots of commands, and there's a lot of them that we'd rather ignore or kind of minimize, but He still sticks with us. Remember His love when it's hard to love. Remember His endurance when the right thing to do is also the hardest thing to do. That happens a lot, doesn't it? The right thing to do is, is the hardest of all of the options. So sometimes telling the truth is really hard to do. Being honest is really hard. But we need to do it. Sometimes drawing boundaries with people, that's really hard to do. Sometimes enforcing boundaries when they keep getting crossed, that's hard to do. But we need to do it. Disciplining your kids is sometimes hard. Obeying your parents is sometimes hard. But it's the right thing to do. Putting your family before your career is sometimes hard to do. Making time for God is sometimes hard to do. But we need to do it. It's the right thing to do. Remember His endurance and His perseverance when the right thing to do is hard. And when you're faced with death, whether it's your own or someone near you, remember that He rose again. Death has no mastery over Him. When He defeated death and He rose again, He made a way for all of us to walk through that same, through that same hole of death. It's very discouraging to face death. It's very sad. And so when you go through that, remember that He conquered death. And that as difficult as it is to face We don't have to be afraid of it anymore. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, your Savior. He's your Savior. Nothing else is. Get in the game. There's all these trophies and all of these sports that we play in life. I kind of looked up a bunch of them here. There's uh, the Lombardi Trophy. There's the Stanley Cup there's a green jacket, there's a gold glove, there's a gold medal. Uh, there's a Heisman Trophy, a Commissioner's Trophy, a Larry O'Brien Trophy, and these are all highly prized, highly esteemed. If you get to hold one of these, wow, that's pretty cool. But none of these even comes close to the glory that we have in store for us. It's not, not even... Com- not even a comparison. It's a whole new category. The glory of heaven awaits us. There's a crown of righteousness, as it says, one place. A crown of life in another place. We have, we have a gold medal that everyone who has won a gold medal would trade all their gold medals to get. I'm thoroughly convinced that that first time when we lock eyes with Jesus Christ and we see who He is, we can see His love for us, that love that He has in His eyes, that love that gave His entire life for us, that love that is unconditional, that is full of grace and just wants to be with us. I bet you, I'm, I'm fully convinced that that will overpower and overwhelm anything that we have in this life or could possibly have in this life. If you had the best possible life, seeing Jesus for the first time is going to blow that away. We have a crown that nothing can compare with here. Keep your eyes on that prize. That's what we're working towards. The joy set before us is too great and what we stand to lose is too small. Paul says in Acts 20, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That's our task too. 
Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, that prize. Take him with you no matter what you're facing. Let's get in the game. And let's talk to him. The Lord God in heaven, we're so grateful that, that we can belong to you and know you. We're so grateful that, Lord, you have given us a crown that's in store for us that, that can't compare with any, any other prize that's here in this world. Lord, help us to get our heads in this game, this game of life. Help us to keep our eyes focused on this goal. And Lord, help us to take you with us, no matter what obstacles we might face. And Lord, we pray that you would be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.